made an old man feel very happy. <laughs> so now moving on in the, within the same context, um, there's something else that we've just really been doing. We've been getting interested in the notion of action outcome learning. So we've, we've talked about prediction error in terms of simple stimulus stimulus or stimulus outcome learning. But what happens if you relate your predictions to the actions that you've made? As I've alluded to at the start, this may be a very important concept in schizophrenia. It may help to models uh, based on this idea that when you make an action, you predict the sensory consequences, may be very important in helping to explain, for example, passivity phenomena or delusions of control. So the next set of studies, which I'll present very briefly, um, really represents the same sort of approach, but this time using a different learning model or, or using the same learning model in a different modality. This was work done, done with a very clever person called Sonne de Witt, who unfortunately has left my group and is now in Amsterdam doing very clever work there, and also with James Moore, Daniel Wolpert, and uh, James Ing Ingram. And Do Sonne is very interested. She worked with Tony Dickinson to do her PhD, and she's very interested in this phenomenon of Pavlovian instrumental transfer, which is yet another of these, those constructs from old associative learning that are really finding their feet again, I think, in the context of modern neuroscientific approaches to psychiatry. And I do think that you know, there's, there's a whole gold mine of basic experimental psychology work that we can dig into um, in order to further our models. But so here's the study that Sonna did. Um, the idea is that we have a symbol on the screen. This is done outside the scanner before they have any scanning. We have a symbol on the screen. And the person learns that if they see this symbol and they press this lever, the left lever, they don't get any reward. But if they press this lever, they get a symbolic reward, but they also score a point, which is also symbolic. So it's not a terribly rewarding task. But if you've got well-motivated subjects, this is fairly rewarding in just being right. Okay? We're a mean bunch, I'm afraid. They see another symbol, and here they discover that you've got to press the left key to get your reward. If you press the right, you don't get it. So it's a simple instrumental learning task, really basic stuff. Now here's the interesting thing. Of course, such a task, which they acquire very rapidly, can be explained in a number of ways. Now, many people would suggest that actually you see this symbol, you think of the reward, and therefore you press the key that was associated with that reward. So this is simple stimulus outcome response learning. It's the sort of thing where you're walking along, you see the coffee shop, you think of the coffee, you take the instrumental response of going in. You know, a lot of our behavior is based upon that sort of imagining the outcome, therefore carrying out the, um, the action that will acquire the outcome. So this is one way of thinking about this. And this is really what we're interested in getting at, is this outcome to response learning, for reasons I'll go into in a second. But the problem is this is ambiguous, because as uh, humans, we are in inherently lazy creatures, and we like to take shortcuts. And it's entirely possible that we don't do this according to a stimulus outcome response uh, uh, learning, but actually we take the shortcut. And we simply learn, see that, press le right, see that, press left. This is habitual responding. It's not goal-directed. And you can quickly show in animals and humans that they develop habitual responding, simple stimulus response associations, which actually become um, almost invulnerable to changing of the outcome. This is how habits develop. So the idea would be simply that, uh, for example, you walk into a room every day and you just hit the light switch because you want the light to come on. One day you find you go in in the middle of the day and you hit the light switch. You didn't want the light on. This wasn't goal-based. You simply walk into the room and you always hit the light switch. This is stimulus response rather than outcome responding. So how do we find out outcome responding? How do we identify this particular relationship? Well, there is another phenomenon that happens called um, outcome-specific Pavlovian instrumental transfer. And what you do here is you teach them this instrumental responding, but then you do some Pavlovian training where they simply see a symbol and they get the reward. Now here they don't do anything. There is no, um, there is no action. So it's the simple distinction between um, the stimulus and the outcome that occurs. Now the interesting thing here is what happens when you put them in the scanner and you say to them, I'm going to show you a whole load of symbols and I just want you to press whichever key comes to mind. doesn't matter which. Don't think too much about it. Just press the key that feels right. 
So what happens to these stim what happens when they see these stimuli here? Theoretically, they should just be at chance because they've, these stimuli have never been associated with an action. But there is a way that they could become associated with an action, and that's because when you see this stimulus, you, th you can think of the banana. You've learnt that. And thinking of the banana reminds you of this action. So you do actually have, there is no pathway from this directly to this, but there is a pathway via the banana. Always remember the pathway via the banana. This is stimulus outcome responding, okay? It's outcome based. And the critical thing is identifying brain regions that will be responsive to outcome based but not to non-outcome based responding because then we have the, the brain regions that are really interesting us. Um, so interestingly, just from the behavioural point of view, what Son has shown is that, all right, if you present them with a cue that they'd already learnt, then they tend to respond. This is the, the, the dark blue represents responding as we predict they would. Whoops, sorry. So they, they respond with the right more on the banana and left on the orange. And there's no surprise in that because that's what they've learnt. If you look at just the fruit itself, they tend to respond with the action that previously produced that fruit. But critically, if you present them with that Pavlovian cue, they are also biased in favour of the response that was associated with the fruit that was associated with the, the responding. So there is a behavioural indication that they've actually learnt this pathway. Okay? Now the brain response that is very specific to that type of trial is pallidum. I think it's pallidum. It could be putamen. Um, and, you know, if there's an anatomist here, they may want to shoot me down. But you know, it, it maps to globus pallidus ventrally, which is in keeping with previous work from Bray et al. in Journal of Neuroscience. So we were very pleased. We replicated this palatable, palatal response. But the critical thing is, how does this palatal response fit in with our overall design, which is to try and relate action outcome responding to in healthy controls to what happens when they're giving ketamine? What, what Are people who show more or less vulnerable to different types of change in <coughs> symptoms or task. In actual fact, if you look at the symptoms they experience on ketamine, again a month later, at low-dose ketamine there is a not quite significant um, tendency, so I'm going to ignore this because it's just too noisy, but at the high dose it's more convincing. And what this suggests is that the people who show the least response here to outcome-specific responding, the least um, Pavlovian instrumental transfer, the ones who are from the neural perspective, least sensitive to this type of learning are the ones who are most likely to get positive symptoms when they get given ketamine. So there's a relationship there a month later. Now we also wanted to look at whether this activation can actually predict how they respond on particular tasks, both on and off ketamine. And we took two tasks that are inherently based upon um, action outcome responding and prediction. One of them, both of them are reasonably well known. Possibly this one uh, is, th is the more well known. So this is based on the idea that when I make an action, I predict the sensory consequences of that action and I cancel them out. In other words, I ignore them. That's why I can't tickle myself. It's because to be ticklish, something has to be unpredictable. So if I try and tickle myself, it's all too predictable. I've cancelled the sensory consequences. Um, People with schizophrenia are actually more accurate at judging internally generated force, as I'll show you, suggesting that they fail to predict the sensory consequences. Now, the other thing that happens with internal actions is that we, we tend to have an, a distorted perception of the time of it. If I make an action that produces an outcome, my experiences of the timing of that are, tend to be compressed in time. So that I, I, when asked to make a judgment, I see them as being closer together, my action and its outcome, than they actually are objectively. I'll just show you that. So this is the work that the first task was based on from uh, Daniel Walpert and others. And what they did was here was people were experiencing, they, they placed their finger under this robotic arm and periodically the robotic arm would compress their finger very, in a very small way. Their instruction was that every time it did that, they had to use another finger to exactly replicate the force that they had just felt. So it's a very simple task. <coughs> now the prediction here is that when they're trying to replicate the arm, because when they press, they cancel the sensory consequences, they will actually feel less than they should. As a consequence, in order to replicate the 